I must find not an equality of a trade with God, but God's forgiveness. I was deeply touched by the one whom many of you respect as the prophet Muhammad, who during his lifetime wiped out the curse of idolatry throughout the whole region that he was laboring in. And that is a curse. But when he was dying, he cast himself upon a merciful God, upon God's graciousness, and upon God's pardon. And actually, any one of us, when we come to face God, no matter what we've done, that is where we stand. But sin, in order to be pardoned, we have a, a not only a gracious God, but a holy God. One without spot, without what, any wrinkle, and that is where there must be some satisfaction of the law of God. I have a law. You break the law, you're punished. Is that right? All right, in order for that punishment to be removed, someone has to satisfy the claim of justice in order for that punishment to be removed. That's where we speak. That's why we speak. That there is no difference for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. That's in the book of Romans, in the Holy Scriptures. And in that book, the reason he said there was no difference was there were so many said, well, because I am such and such, because I belong to such and such, therefore I am uh, much better. But this law had to be satisfied. Now, the ancient Jews satisfied they, they had a sacrifice, a sacrifice of atonement. They had a sin offering, a transgression offering. And they, sat, they were seeking the mercies of God, recognizing that they could not obtain these mercies on their own worth. But this offering symbolized something of their desire to be reconciled to God. Too often, many people are sorry for sin only in one sense. They're like the fellow in... Stateside was caught in court. He was in court for some very serious misdemeanor. And the judge said to him, have you anything to say for yourself before we sentence you? He said, yes, your honor. I am sorry I was caught. And that's where many people's sorry goes. That is not the sorrow we speak of. When we speak of repentance, and this is, applies to all our faith and all of us tonight, we're speaking of a deep sorrow that turns us from sin and turns us to God, seeking his forgiveness. But in order for this to be done, this, this claim, this justice has to be satisfied. Let me take you. Why the sacrifices? Now, we accept all of us here tonight, whether we be Jew, whether we be Islam, whether we be Christian, we all accept the fact that the son of Abraham was freed by a substitute sacrifice. And the Quran speaks of it so well. Then the problem comes is, where is the problem of accepting the fact that the Lord Jesus is spoken of as a greater sacrifice when John the Baptist said of him, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He had the sign. He was born of a virgin. We accept that. He had another sign. His name would be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. This was of the Son that was born. He was given a sign at his birth. And this is recognized by both Islam and Christians. And what is that? That is the name. The name Jesus. The name Jesus means Savior. In fact, it's better than that. It means God, our Savior. Now, he had another name that was given to him, not by his mother, not by some friends, but by God himself. His name will be Emmanuel. El is the ancient Hebrew word for God. Emmanuel means God with us. And then he himself was called Christ. Which is, which is the Old Testament, the New Testament word or Greek word for the word Messiah. Messiah means the God-anointed one. 
Now, if I met a man who had that name on him and who said to me, before Abraham was, I am, now the I am was given to Moses. When Moses said to God, who I send, that's who I say that sent me, he said, you say that I am sent you. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, I would somehow say that that man was carrying the name of God. In fact, that was why the religious leaders of that time accused him of blasphemy. Who is this Jesus? Both Islam and committed Christians, I'm not speaking of these new fellows that are trying to find out his words and change the uh, different scriptures, but both of these are committed to the fact that he is faultless, he is sinless, he was a prophet born of the Virgin Mary. We go a little further and we say he was named by God with these names indicating who he was and his nature. Jesus, when he was tempted, do you know what he did when he was tempted? What was his answer when he was tempted? Some of you who know the New Testament scriptures, it says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That was the answer of the Lord Jesus, the faultless one, the sinless one, the one who could not lie, who would not tell an untruth. He was the one who foretold his death. He showed his disciples in Matthew, the 16th chapter, that he must go up to Jerusalem. Now listen to this. He must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed. In fact, one of the disciples said, Oh Lord, come on, be easy on yourself. Don't take that view. But he recognized his mission as a Messiah was to be our atonement. Because we could not have an atonement. I could not atone for my sins, people. How could a, a, a wicked person say, well, God has forgiven me. Now I'm going to atone for the bats. I can't. But it is God's atonement. And I do not mean by this, listen to me carefully, I do not mean by this some easy believism where you simply put up your hand and say, I've accepted Christ and therefore I'm it. No. What we're, we're saying, and this we agree with, it's submission to the will of God. It's obedience to the will of God. And this applies to every one of us, no matter what our label is. Forget our labels for a moment. When we stand before God, I'm not going to stand there as Christian. Really, I'm not. And you're not going to stand there as Islam. You're going to stand there just with your own name and be judged for the deeds done in the body. This is why in a gathering like this, we want to not only take the different viewpoints and consider them, but have a practical application and say, may we go, and I trust that this may be a result, that we go from this place better than when we came in. Jesus said, I lay down my life that I might take it again. Jesus said that he would be, suffer many things, be killed, and be raised the third day. Jesus also said, Behold, now this is what he said to his disciples. He said, Behold, I go up to Jerusalem. All right. And the Son of Man will be betrayed by the chief priests. And, and he shall deliver him. I'm shortening it here. He shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, to scourge, to crucify him. And on the third day, he shall rise again. By the way, that agrees with a statement in the Quran that the Jews did not crucify Jesus. He was delivered to the Gentiles to be crucified. If some of you think that you're a smart Gentile or a white person, it's us that bore part of that burden. But the act of crucifixion wasn't the only thing. It was the burden of the fact that he was dying, dying for the people, dying just like the lamb for the substitute. Let's go here a little further. And look, it tells us of Moses and Elijah. Now we all know the prophet Moses. We know the prophet Elijah. We all recognize him. They were pictured as talking with the Lord Jesus on the mount. And they were talking of his coming decease. And then we come to make our position clear tonight. Now I, I'm I'm not asking you necessarily to agree with me or disagree. I'm saying 
we're trying to say here, we're giving you two viewpoints. We're saying here, consider them. There they crucified him is the scripture verse that is unequivocal, no mistake. There's no mistaking it. It says there, there on, the, on that place, they crucified him. They crucified him. They didn't feed him. They didn't tangle with him. They crucified him. And then another scripture, it says he died for our sins. No mistake. It doesn't say he, he went and swooned. He died for our sins. Third one, he is risen, which gave the resurrection proof. And the uh, Christian scripture is very plain on that. Brother Didat raised a good point. He said that so often at the headings of the gospel, says according to the God, Matthew and according to Mark, now, the according to there is not even in the original text. Do you know why? We don't have to sign these texts. Because these are the scriptures not given by man. They were given by God in the, in the word of God. Thank you. In the word of God, it says, Christ died according to the scriptures. He rose again according to the scriptures. That's where we take our position.